Woods. I'm with R2 Sports Technology. We're located out here uh, in the Denver, Colorado area, actually just a little bit south of Denver. Um, so we're on Mountain Time. It's about nine o'clock in the morning, our time right now. Uh, so I appreciate you taking a second to, to join us and kind of take a look through some of the stuff. Um, the first thing I always start with is, number one, I am not what I am and what I'm not. I'm not a football coach. I've, I've never been a football coach. Don't anticipate ever being a football coach. Um, I'm a data guy by trade. Years and years of work in the aerospace and defense industry is kind of where my roots are. Working with places like Lockheed Martin and uh, companies like Boeing and NASA and places like that. We've done about a lot of data work in that world. We also do a lot of work in the financial markets world and uh, and stuff in the sports world. So we actually kind of as a uh, well, it wasn't entirely by chance, but we ran across a Division Two team about seven eight years ago that showed us their film data and what they're doing with film data. And when we saw it, we're like, shoot, there's a lot of things we do with data we can do to help football coaches. And so for about the last seven eight years, we've been involved with helping football programs as well with their data. But the bottom line, again, is I'm not a coach. Uh, I come at everything from a data person's perspective. So I always will defer to you guys. I mean, you have the challenge of getting a bunch of young guys to win a football game. And I, I know you're breaking down film. You're doing a lot of things because you you want to achieve that goal. <clears throat> I respect the the difference between, you know, we're sitting here kind of in a classroom, so to speak, in a real clinical environment here talking about some things. I know how hard it is to take that and to, and to move it into reality. So I always defer to you guys in your experience. Take what I say with a grain of salt um, because there's certain things we may encourage you to think about and do that practically get harder for you to do. So I appreciate the difference between saying, hey, we're just here trying to hear some ideas and, and what you got to do to actually win. So I know it, it can be different. Um, the other thing I always want to start out with uh, Coach, it's good to have you guys with us. We're just getting rolling here this morning. Um, is we are so I'm R2 Sports Technology is our company. That is a good old American for profit business. Okay, so we we work with football programs is part of some of the things that we do. But I want to encourage you right now. This is not a veiled sales pitch. Okay, so I'm not gonna I'm not like faking you out to get you in here and then at the end tell you, hey, here's how much this cost. None of that's gonna happen. Okay, this is very much a session about teaching you guys some things. I hope you can get a few things related to um, you know, how you do things with film data that can make you a little bit better. That's it. At the end, we will, if you want to stick around at the end, we'll show you some of the things that we do as it relates to the topic we're going through today. But there's no compulsion, no sales pitch, nothing like that. So so hopefully that's clear. Um, so here's what we're going to do to get started. Let me, let me share my screen. We're going to walk you through some notes, basically. Um, we'll kind of build this note sheet as we go. When we're done with the session, uh, we'll send you these notes so you've got them and you can uh, refer back to this if you want. We're also recording this session. It'll be available at some point if you miss some stuff, want to go back and take a look. But this is a second. Uh, we, we do three of these sessions each spring, and this is the second of them. The first one that we did about a month ago was all about three purposes for film data. And we really, in there, we try and address three big things you should be doing with your film data and how that should impact what you're including and how you're breaking film down. So we get into some principles about that. The second one specifically hones in on being predictive with your data. We're gonna look at how you can expose high probability tendencies that are buried down in your data. Now, just a quick word on this, a couple of things. When we talk about a high probability tendency, what I'm talking about here, because you guys, I'm sure you have no lack of tendency reports. I'm just, you know, you guys, whether you use Huddle or Exos or DV Sport, whatever, all these film systems have your, your typical reports. I'm sure you guys are, are you know, up to your neck and looking at, you know, a down and distance report and a formation based report. You can see tendency reports all the time. What we're talking about here, what we're trying to uncover, and, and this is really the things we're going to share with you here are not unique to football. We're going to show how we apply it to football, but this is the same thing. We do a lot of predictive work, like I mentioned, in financial markets, for aerospace and defense, and a number of different places. These same principles we're going to talk about, the same principles that we use when we're trying to predict, you know, where the Apple stock price is going to go in the next 12 hours. I mean, it's, it's the same principles. But 
there's a difference between looking at a tenancy report and really exposing something that's a high probability tenancy. And what I mean by high probability tenancy is something that I'm like, boy, 80, 90% sure that thing's going to happen. Okay. What, when we get to the end of this, here's what I hope you guys can understand from this is that A, those types of tendencies are all over the place in your data. I mean, I'm talking all over the place. There are hundreds of them. Okay. But I'm going to, so I, but now I got to couch it a little bit. They're not easy to find. Okay. They're there and they're potentially game changing, but getting to them isn't easy. So I'm, I'm going to lay out the, A, how you get to them. Um, and I'm going to, we're going to get mechanical. We're going to open some data in a second. I'm going to show you what it would take to make it happen. But, but fundamentally, what we're going to get through here is you have to set your data up in a certain way to allow you to even find them to make it even possible. So that's where we're going to start. Okay, first, let's talk about two types of tendencies that we kind of uh, characterize, kind of in, in our data brains as we look at them. They're what we call situational tendencies first. A situational tendency is something that you, it's a tendency you can pick up on without, without your opponent showing you anything, okay? You don't need them to break the huddle. You don't need them to show you a thing. And there are certain tendencies that you can come to right away. They're based on things that are instantly knowable. Okay, and they're fairly obvious things. Down, distance, where they are in the field, maybe what hash they're on. But there's anything that you can think of that you can know without needing to see what the other team can do. And those include things like the quarter, the score, what the previous play was, anything that you can know. Now, there's an advantage to these types of tendencies in that, you know, in, obviously in a live game situation, things are moving fast. A situational tendency is one that you can pick up on really quick and that you theoretically, while it's still tight, you have some, you have a little bit of time to do something about it. Okay. Especially, but well, I mean, you have, if you're an offensive guy and you, you have the advantage of controlling the pace of the game. So you could know instantly, Hey, I, based on this situation alone, I am 80% sure he's going to be in cover three on the next play. Let's say, right. You have the advantage of picking that up knowing it and controlling the pace enough to do something about that. If you're a defensive guy, you can still pick up on that quickly enough to you know, maybe message something into your defense about what's likely coming or not coming. Now, the challenge with these are, because they're in situations like down distance, that kind of stuff, they're in, they're in fairly obvious situations, okay? It's not anything real exotic. It's, they're fairly obvious. So that what happens with those is, you guys can appreciate this as coaches. You don't want to be predictable. You probably spend a lot of time intentionally trying to not be predictable. Well, these are very standard, typical situations. These are your typical down and distance report kind of things. It's harder to hide in the obvious situations. So we can find them, but sometimes they're not quite as compelling as the other type we'll look at here in a second. I liken this to this little edge down here. It's almost like finding a bowling ball in a haystack. They're there. They may not be obvious, but they're big enough that you can pull them out and do something about them. Now, the other type of tendency is what we call a structural tendency. Structural tendencies are one, are ones that we can pick up on things once our opponent shows us what he's going to do, all right? or at least or at least gives us a visual picture of what he's doing. So once we see his structure, there's certain things we can know. So when he breaks huddle, and we can pick up and we can see his, we can see what personnel group he, he's in, or maybe we could see what kind of front they're showing us, or how many guys are in the box, or are there corners up in press coverage, or are they off? What's the formation, strength, motion, all those kind of things. Now these are the kind of things. You can think every coach, I mean, we all, I mean, again, I'm sure you guys are very intentional about trying to not be predictable, but we all, everybody has tendencies and everybody's, every coach has a fingerprint, unique fingerprint you can pick up on. The problem, the challenge is, is it, those things are hidden down in these unique combinations of things. So when I say here, you know, we talk about finding an 80, 90 percent probability that somebody's got. They are all over the place. The challenge is they're in these unique combinations of things. So as coaches, you may be trying to not be predictable. But when when push comes to shove and the game's going on and things are moving fast, coaches tend to revert back to things that they're comfortable with just by human nature. Right now, they may not always be obvious to pick up on, but they're in there. And where you find them are in these unique combinations of these kind of things. So you may not see a guy having a dominant tendency on first down, let's say, right? But on first down from the right hash, when he uses this motion, boom, 90% of the time, here's what happens. 
So the high probability stuff happens in these combinations of these detailed things, okay? But the first thing we want to look at when we get going with this here is understand these two different types of things because this dictates what needs to be in your film breakdown data and how it needs to be set up. So you have situational tendencies. Again, I don't need to know anything. I don't care what he shows me. I don't care. Just based on the situation alone, I can pick up on things. Those let me move fast, okay? But they're less specific sometimes. And then I've got the specific ones. The challenge with these, the structural ones, are they get revealed late in the play clock. So when they reveal themselves, you don't have much time to do anything about it. You know, a guy goes in motion, it's two seconds before they snap the ball. So those types of things, they have big tendencies, but those you really have to prep for throughout the week. You have to find them, isolate the few you care about, and really prep your guys to look for certain things. That's the keys. Now, let's talk about how we set data up to find these things. The first principle we, we have to talk about is what's called independent and dependent variables. And this is, I'm not trying to turn this back into a high school math class. If you remember this from high school math, it's the concept of, well, again, like an, an independent and dependent variable. What that simply means is, you know, a dependent variable is something that we're looking to try and predict. And we think it's a function of, or it happens because of a list of potential independent variables. In the world of football, okay, the way you answer, and, and what you have to have in your data in your data set, you have to have independent and dependent variables. How do you flush those out? Most of the time you have them there, but sometimes there's things in film data that are extraneous and don't matter and they're in there and they don't serve any purpose. If you want to be predictive, you need to think along these two lines. A dependent variable is this. As a coach, if you add, just answer this question for yourself, if I could know anything about the next play, what would I want to know? However you answer that question is... Those, those are your dependent variables. Those are the things you're trying to predict. So, you know, if, if you're a defensive coach and you're saying, okay, what would I love to know about the next play? I'd love to know, you know, what the next play is going to be. I want to know if they're going to run or pass. I want to know who they're going to target. I want to know where they're going to try and throw the ball. I want to know what type of running play it is. All those types of, any way you answer that question, you have to have something in your data set where you're breaking that down clearly, okay? So, the other thing I'll encourage you on is that you have to think, I encourage you guys to think conceptually first. Don't get too specific too early because we'll get to this, the, our other issue here. We talk about when, you put, when you're putting film data together, and I'll, I'll go ahead and bring it up now, and we'll kind of toggle between both of these, is you need to aggregate your data into higher level groups. You need to be conceptual because if you're going to find a tendency that makes a difference and that you can actually pick up on, you can rely on, your sample size has to be big enough to be able to count on it, right? If you if you see the guy who did something three times out of three times, that's good, but can we really rely on that or is it just chance, right? So you want your sample sizes to big as, be as big as possible. So while you think through, what do I want to know on the next play? You need to think about it conceptually first. If you get too specific, your sample sizes will shrink too much. So I'm a defensive coach and I'm thinking about the things I want to know. I would love to know what play is going to run. But what play he's going to run is a very specific thing. And that can be really hard because he may only run that specific play a couple of times and my sample size isn't going to be big enough to pick up on it. What might be obviously just as powerful, but very powerful still might be, okay, maybe I won't know exactly what play he's going to run, but can I know what direction he's going to go? Is he going to go left or right? Is he going to go to the field or the boundary? Those are big enough categories that they'll be big enough sample size for you to pick up a pattern on. So you may not know exactly what play he's going to run, but you could know with a high degree of certainty that he's going to the field on this play. And that can be a big difference maker for you in the way you prepare. So, so think through what you want to know, but then capture it at a conceptual grouped higher level. Okay. Now, from the independent variable standpoint, so that answering that question flushes out your dependent variables. From an independent variable standpoint, it really comes down to what you as a coach tell people to key on. Okay, what are the things that you preach and teach to your guys as keys in a game? In other words, yeah, again, I'm an offensive guy and I'm working with my quarterback and I'm telling them, hey, I want you to look at the, how many guys do they have in the box? Maybe that's a key, right? So if that's something that you guys key off of and tell guys to key off of, then those, those are your independent variables. Those things need to be in your data also, okay? In your data and also grouped at a level where you can get a big enough sample size. So if you look and you say, okay, well, I, want, I tell my quarterback to key off of the front, let's say, right? So if you do that, you don't wanna to get too specific with all these crazy different exotic fronts. 
you probably would just want to have like a front family where it just says odd or even or something like that over or under. If you group it at that level, then your quarterback could come up and he can see that. And he can he may not know the specific front name, but that's even or that's odd. So keep it at a grouped conceptual level, but focus on the things that you preach guys to key off of. And those are the things that become your independent variables. If you have those in your data, the things you tell them to key off of, and you have the things you're looking for, and you put them at a conceptual level, you're going to be able to find a lot of high probability tendencies. Okay, so that's the way we structure things. Again, aggregating data is key because that allows you to get bigger sample sizes without breaking down more film. You don't have to go break down five games on a guy. You could break down three, but if you group it right, you're going to get plenty of sample size in there. Okay. Now, just a couple, I get this, you ask this question a lot from a statistical standpoint, people ask me all the time, how many, how many is enough? How many do I have my, need to have my sample size? It's tough. It's tough to answer. You always want as much as possible is the answer. But from a statistical standpoint, you you love it if you can get sample sizes that are bigger than 15, okay? We can probably like it if they're above seven. Uh, and we have to be a little bit cautious otherwise. So if I see something that happened, you know, three out of five times, it's a 60% tendency. Yeah, it is, but I have to be a little careful with it. If I see six out of 10, I feel better about six out of 10 than I do three out of five, okay? So we're trying to group to get to those sample sizes. Now, let's talk about now what it takes to actually find these. And I'm going to, we're going to get, I'm going to dive out of this and we're going to bring up an, a file and we're going to, we're going to stumble a little bit through a file together. Okay. But here's the big things. And let me lay these out there and then we'll, we'll take a look and we'll, we'll play around with these here a little bit. So if you're going to find highly accurate, high probability tendencies in your data. Okay. First thing, this is, then this is what's key. And this is probably the biggest thing that's the challenge. Um, well, it's not the biggest. There's another challenge that's bigger. I'll, I'll get into that one in a second. But one challenge is if you want to be accurate, so it's easy to generate a down and distance report. It's easy for a film system to kick a report out. It is. But, but those things aren't always accurate from a predictive standpoint. The key to being accurate when you're predicting what's trying to happen is that you have to focus on what matters and what doesn't. So in other words, if I'm trying to predict hey, is, does this guy send pressure in this situation? And I'm looking at certain things I'm trying to key off of. I'll be accurate if the things I'm keying off of are things that actually statistically matter, okay? There's the old term, something being statistically significant. You have to know that, okay, well, I'm going to key off of, um, you know, the down and distance, let's say, right? And that may be something that does matter, so that's a good predictor of it. But if I'm also keying off of the hash, let's say, and maybe statistically hash really doesn't matter. Well, if I'm keying off of hash thinking it matters when it doesn't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss on the accuracy of my predictions, okay? So the key is you have to focus on what matters and what doesn't. How do you know what matters and what doesn't? Now, this is where, this is again, here's the data guy in me. So forgive, forgive me already for the next thing I'm gonna say, because this is a very data guy thing to say. There's a scientific way to do it, okay? Um, but it's not, but I respect the fact you guys are football coaches and you're trying to get to a different end game. I'm not expecting you guys to be data analysts, okay? If there's a football guy out there who who is like a data nerd and really is like, oh my God, I really want to get into that. Great. Here's the scientific way to do it. I'm going to say it and then we'll jump off of it real quick because I don't want to waste too much time on it. There's a mathematical process called chi-square testing, okay? And what it lets you do is take two different things and compare them. And there's a mathematical formula you can use that will tell you whether this matters when you're looking at something else. Okay. Now, in a few minutes, like I said here, I'll show you some of the things that we do in this world for coaches. We have software we've written that does these chi-square tests for us that tells us automatically, hey, um, hash doesn't matter when you're predicting blitz. And uh, this doesn't matter, but this, this, and this do. Okay. So there's ways of knowing that. But I don't expect you guys out there to all start thinking about, I'm going to go research and study how to do a chi-square test on data. I have no expectation for you to do that. So your other method is experiential. You rely on your coaching experience. What, what do you do? Like, how do you decide to blitz somebody? Okay. And, and you say, well, okay, I make the decision based on this, this, here's where I'm going to bring it from. Flip it from that other guy's perspective and understand, okay, here's the things that matter to me. When I make that kind of decision, I'm making it based on X, Y, and Z. 
then those are the things that you should focus on as things that matter. Use your coaching experience to tell you what matters and what doesn't. Okay. There is a scientific way. Um, it can be done, but but if you're just doing things by hand, I would I would defer to your experience. Okay. Now, this is the biggest challenge to the whole thing. Um Finding these tendencies, and again, they're all over the place. I'm going to show you in a minute. I'm going to show you teams where there are literally thousands of them, okay? They're all over the place. These high probability things are hidden in these unique combinations of things. So the big challenge is you have to iterate through different combinations looking for tendencies, okay? It's an iterative process. It's not a hard process, but it's it's iterative, and it takes a lot of time, okay? But you can get through them all. There's something in math right down here called the principle of counting, okay? Now, I throw this out to just uh, make us look like we're mathematicians or something, but it, it is a real principle. If you have M ways of doing something and N ways of doing something else, then there are M times N ways of doing both, okay? So what that means is, okay, now, confusing enough, let's put that in football terms. If I'm looking at things like, maybe I'm trying to look at down, distance, hash, and personnel even those four things, right? And I'm trying to predict if a team's going to run or pass or if they're going to throw it to a certain guy or not. Well, you have, let's even call it three downs. Let's talk, let's look at maybe three different distance categories, uh, three hashes, and maybe this team puts up uh, four personnel groupings that they work from, okay? Well, what that means is the number of combinations where they could be hiding a tendency is three times three times three times four. Okay, so that's, that's 27, 81, uh, times four, 300, that's 324 different combinations right there alone, okay, where they could, where where one of their big tendencies could be hidden down in there. That becomes the challenge that we're going to talk about in a second, but let me show you, let's get into some film data, and let me just kind of give you a quick idea. So when you, when you iterate through things, let's look here, let's go to a, let's look at an offensive staff here, because this is an offensive coordinator in this case, we could go either way, but I'll go offense today. Um, so this is just a dump of data out of their film system into an Excel file. So if you were to try to do this thing manually, I would say take your data, dump it to Excel, okay? If you've never done this before, you can filter data in Excel. If you come to this, the, head, the top row where all the field names are, um, well, I'm not trying to make this an Excel class either, but I'll just so you see it real quick. You can dump your data to Excel, go to that first row, highlight the first row. If you go under data, you can unfilter, but there's a filter thing right there. If you click on filter, it'll put all these little drop downs on all your data. So you can filter your data in Excel real quick. Okay. So let's say I'm a, I'm an offensive coach. So I've got information here. When I highlighted here, we see these light blue things, the light blues, down distance, field position, all that kind of stuff. That is all, um, those were what I would call situational markers. Okay. So those define a situation in the game. The darker blue ones in there, those are all structural things. Here's personnel groupings and motions and whether they're strong right or strong left. Over here in the green are things I'm trying to predict. This is defensive stuff. I have defensive personnel. Are they in sub or base? What type of front are they in? Do they stunt? Do they blitz? On and on and on. Coverages, all that. Those are the things I want to predict. So that's just a real quick example. So I always tell guys, when you start decomposing data, you try and find these kind of tendencies, let, let your call sheet be your guide. Okay, so however you have your call sheet structured, you should go to a section of your call sheet, <coughs> excuse me, and start to dial that up. So let's say on your call sheet, you just have something that's as simple as uh, maybe it's first and 10 from between the 40s. I'm making that up a little bit, but let's say we do that. So I can come over here to my data in here, and I'm going to dial up that situation first. So I'm going to come over here. Uh, they, have, they have a zero down for possession and 10. I'm going to include them both. So I'm going to say, just give me possession and 10 and first and 10. I'm going to filter that. I'm going to go to distance and say, give me just 10 yards to go. And I'm going to come to my field position here. I got my minus 40. That uh, might have been a mistake because I got to filter some of these out. But I'll get rid of some of the things. I'll oh, say between the 20s, something like that, just to make it go a little faster. Maybe I won't, I won't give it of all these. It'll take me too much time. But let me, let me hone in on a specific part of the field. So now I'm dialing up a call sheet situation. First and 10 from a certain part of the field. Now, in Excel, you see down here, if you've ever noticed this down here, at the bottom, it'll tell you how many records that is. So there's 172 of them that fit that criteria down here. 
So I got 172 things here I'm looking at in this situation. Now, let's say I'm looking for whether or not they, they blitz or not. Okay. So here I am filtered to this spot. I can come over here to blitz, and I'm just going to keep it real simple right now. They have a field we call just blitz, yes or no. Are they sending pressure, yes or no? So I have 172 total records. I can come over here and say how many of them have a yes in it. Uh, 40 of them. So 40 out of 172. So on first end, that part of the call sheet, they are less than 25% likely to, to blitz. Okay. But now what I get, what I need to do is look into look into things in more detail. Now I need to start saying, okay, that's that's one condition, but I need to look at all these different combinations of other things I've got in here. So maybe I, what I can look at is say, okay, well, let's say, what if I'm in 11 person, let's check 11 personnel. When I go to 11 personnel now, and let's go 11 personnel and strong right. When I'm 11 personnel strong right, now you can see I got 61 of these down here. So now there's 61 of them. So now I come back, how many times do they blitz in this situation? Uh, it's 12 out of 61, a little less likely. I got to go back. Now I'm doing this. This is intentionally boring you. I know I'm, just, I'm doing this for effect. So that's one look. That's that's when they're 12, 11 personnel strong right. Well, what if we're 11 personnel strong left? So strong left, 55 times now I've got that. And how many times did they blitz in that case? They blitzed 11 of 55. Still about 20%. No real difference that I'm seeing there. Now, at the same time, I could be checking other things like how many guys are they going to rush or how, what coverage, you know, what coverage are they going to be in? You know, out of 55 times, how many times are they in cover three? Only four times out of 55 are they in cover three. Um, you know, let's go to cover four real quick. All these things are different things we can check. There's 20 out of 55 they're in cover four. Now, the tent is this. I'm going to come back over here. Here's the challenge. If you, it, the challenge is the number of combinations to look for, okay? The reality is there are plenty of places down in that data where we'll find things where it sticks out. We'll, we could probably find ones where the blitz is now suddenly 70% yes, that they are definitely blitzing. And it, but it's in this unique thing. It's in 12 personnel, strong left, first and 10. Here's that unique situation. It's in there. It's just not in an obvious place because these guys are they're not going to be that obvious. But his behavior, his pattern can be picked up on. But you have to check the things that matter and you have to exhaustively search all the combinations to find them. OK, now acknowledge I'm acknowledging the fact here. We'll come back to this. We're almost at the bottom of the hour, so I got to start wrapping up here. Um, and here's what we'll do in a second. What I'm gonna, I am going to wrap here in just a minute with these last few comments. And I'll start to show you kind of how how we approach that. Again, I'm not trying to turn this into sales pitch, but I want you to understand that it is possible once you can see in there. The key to that, though, across this whole thing, first of all, if your data is not set up right, you'll never find them. OK, so it won't matter what you do. If you haven't thought through, here's what I want to predict, here's the things I'm going to key off of, and I'm going to group them at a high enough level that I can get good sample sizes, okay? If you've done that, then it's at least possible, okay? If you haven't done that, it's not even going to be possible no matter what you do. But this process down here of what matters and getting through all the combinations, that is something that, no, I don't care how many GAs you have, but, but and that's good. You can stick a GA off doing this if you can, but if you're a high school program, you have no help like that, it's not going to happen. You know, guys going off and searching through all these combinations takes forever because literally there are tens and tens and tens of thousands of different combinations where a tendency can be hidden. It really ultimately to do it exhaustively requires some level of automation to go through. And that's that's kind of one of the things that we've done here on this end is say, OK, it's not a it's not a conceptually hard thing to do. It's just a practically hard thing to do, to go through every combination to do that. So we have tools here that allow, and there are tools out there that allow you to, to automatically go through them all and search them all and find them all. Now, when we do that, I'm just going to leave you with this as an example, and then I'll keep going with it if we want. We'll stop here in a second. This is an example of a report. This is now, this is a high school in Alabama, okay? A defensive coordinator at a high school level. So a high school, college really doesn't even matter. You guys have data set up right. So in this case, what he was trying to predict just looking at this screen real quick. Over here on the left, there's some categories over here. So he's got things like 
play direction, run pass, fielder boundary, the offensive play. He's got some things he's trying to predict over here, okay? Over on the right, he's got some independent variables he's looking at. He looks at down, distance, field position, hash. These are the kind of things he looks at. In the middle, this, this massive report in the middle has tendencies out the wazoo that are in there in these combinations. And these tendencies, in this case, uh, I kid you not, there are 208,187 tendencies that are buried in this data, okay? And there are examples of one, like here's one right here, um, 100% tendency four out of four times when this team is on the right hash and 12 personnel, if they motion to the right every time they've gone to the boundary. Okay, so that's an obscure combination. It's buried down in there, but the only way to find it is to, is to filter your way there and to go through every combination and flush them out. Okay, now with a report like this, I'll, I'll walk off with this and then we'll keep going in a minute if you want to see more. You can very quickly dial things in. Say, so show me, show me things where it's eighty percent or more likely to happen, um, where the number of occurrences is more than three. Maybe there's at least seven, like we talked about. We like to get to seven. Show me some things where eighty percent or more, seven occurrences, uh, and where I only have to pick up on like three things to detect it. Okay, if I turn that down like that, boom, 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 just that fast. Man, here's here's there's already there's 350 of those in here. So here's all these things. Here's where I can see. Here's a 91% on a play. 10 of 11 times if they're in gun near, strong right, and they motion to the left, um, they're running a lead zone play. So I leave you with that just to say it's possible. They're all over the place. They're just not in obvious places. Okay. And getting to them requires you set your data upright and you have to iterate and look and let your call sheet guide you, but ultimately to really exhaustively search, you gotta do something that's related to automation, okay? Now, so um, let me leave that there. I know we're at the bottom of the hour, I've already got two minutes over, so forgive me for that. Um, what I'll do, if you have questions and stuff, I'll look at it, see if there's any questions from the chat. Um, you can come off mute, by all means, hit me with questions. Um, if there are questions, what I'll do is I'll roll for a few more minutes showing you a little bit more in that tendency stuff and some of the other things that we do. If you're, well, like I said, we'll send you these slides, that is notes, so you have the notes you can refer back to. If you've got some data on an opponent you wanna send us, we're happy to run it through our system here to generate a report like that. If you go mess around with it, see what you think about it, um, you're more than welcome to do that. We'll include that in the email that we send out also. But thank you guys for participating. I will say this, this quick one we do, we're gonna do this one more time in April. The one we do in April is my favorite of them all. Um, what we do in April is we show you, it, it's kind of stunning here. We, we show you how you can take your cell scout data and your opponent scout data, put the two together. And you know, a week before you ever play a football game, it can show you where good and bad play calls are. Um, and, the, and the power of operating from a good play calling position versus a bad one, we'll show you the difference it makes and how you can set your data up to make you a better play call. That's in April. So look for that. Um, we'd love to have you participate there too. So um, I'll open up for questions now. If you got to go, thank you again for taking time. And I'll go ahead and just go a little bit more through that report and show you some of the other things that we do if you're game for that. Okay. Let me check. Um, uh, coach, so I see there's some questions here from uh, Coach Hovey. Good to have you, Coach. Good to see you. <laughs> um, so I'll, let me let me circle back to a couple of these other questions. You, you talked about how many, like some of the, we do something called a dashboard where we can put data into a, a format that uh, can kind of show you different tendencies and things. Uh, Coach, your quick answer to that one is uh, you can put as many as you want, as many as you want. And we can, we have ways of taking a dashboard and, and collapsing that data so it doesn't uh, take up too much space on the screen, if that helps you. We can talk about that in a little bit. So, yeah. so is this code breaker thing that's different than the dashboard? Are they connected? Yeah. Out? Do they work together yeah. at all? They're very similar. They're kind of play off of each other, but they're two distinct different things. In effect, what so we have so I'm, I'll I'll show this here a little bit more. Let me come back over here to this report if I can get there. So we have an application that's called Code Breaker. That's what this thing is called here. We do other things out there, coach. And if some of you guys are interested in seeing these, we can show you them too. We have something called a dashboard. That's what we looked at in our last session that kind of shows how it's a diagnostic report, shows you where a team is good or bad. In effect, the code breaker is different from that. What code breaker does is it goes through, it looks at all the different combinations of those boxes on that dashboard and shows where things are sticking out. Okay. 
But in this case here, so take, take this as an example. This again, this is a defensive coordinator here. Like if he wanted to really hone in. So here's the challenge, I say, with some of these things. Because they are, I told you, these tendencies are all over the place in data, and they are. The, it, the challenge can be, it can be somewhat overwhelming at times, right? So you're a coach, and you here's 300 and some odd, ten, it's just so much. So I always encourage guys that they need to think about what, what what's keeping you up at night. You're coming in playing against somebody, right? Maybe let's let's take a defensive coordinator's role right now. What is the thing that's that's giving you heartburn? What's your worry points? Where are you concerned? And focus in on those. So if I'm in there and I'm worried about you know specific uh, play calls that they might get me with, right? I can hone in here. So there's these different categories here, and one is offensive play. So I could just click on offensive play and say, just let's not worry about directions, all this other stuff. Just show me offensive play. And the way I have this thing filtered here, I've got it saying 80% or more, seven or more occurrences. And this indicators thing tells me how many things would I have to pick up on to get it. So some of these things can get real complicated. You have to have five, six, seven things line up for it to show up. And that can be too much to try and tr process in a game. But I can very quickly hone in on just the things I'm worried about. Now, I'm worried about this lead zone play. Well, here's a spot where I can be 91% sure it's coming. Now, I can focus on that, and I can say, okay, strong right, motioning to the left, and a gun near back set. Now, if that's something I'm really concerned about, I can focus just on – I can pull that one nugget out, and I can work with my guys all week and say, guys, here's what we're looking for. Here's what we're looking for, okay? If you see them strong right, motion left, it's probably coming, okay? It's, it's that kind of thing we can flush out. But that's not the kind of thing that's going to show up on a typical down-distance report because that's – it's buried down in there, okay? Now – and I could look at something, I could look at it a different way and say, maybe I only want to pick up on two things because my guys aren't real bright, right? That'd be too rude to them. So I may have to hear, so here I, I went to, uh, so here's things, I, here's things I can pick up on where you only need to know two things, two things. Like here's boundary, they go to the boundary. If it's, if they have seven to 10 yards to go and they're in a triple formation, 86% of the time it goes to the boundary, okay? We can get real simple if we want. But the point is there are thousands and thousands of things in here that you can go and search on. Now, I'll show you one other thing we do too. And we can, uh, we're willing to take questions and spin one of these up for you, all that kind of stuff. But before I do that, let me show you, let's go to a, let's go to an offensive guy. This is a, this is Western Michigan's offense. Doesn't matter. I, I must say this, I'm going to be careful. It really doesn't matter if it's a high school team, a college team, a D3 team, an NFL team. If you have data, it works and looks the same. Okay, their data is not all that much shockingly different from anybody else's. But if I'm an offensive coordinator here, and I've got this thing set up where I'm looking for things that are 80% or higher, five or more occurrences, only got to pick up on three things. Now, um, and maybe I'm looking for coverages. So if, hey, this guy's looking for coverage. So here's cover one and cover two. So here's a few things in here. Oddly enough, uh, well, and let's let's do this. Eh, let's go cover two here. Some of these aren't too shocking. Some of these might be things you'd pick up on already. If it's third down, 11 plus, and you're in the middle of the field, um, they're almost 80% of the time you're going to find them in, in cover two. Okay. If I'm looking for whether they're going to blitz, yes or no, are they bringing pressure? Okay. And maybe I'm looking specifically for times when they do bring pressure. Here's some of these. If it's um, like this is picking up on – uh, they have something in there called the linebacker that so they they pick up they read off of a linebacker and where he's positioned so in this case if it's 11 or more yards to go and the linebacker's in the split position which means something to them doesn't mean anything to me nine out of ten times they brought they blitzed so there's things like that you can pick up on you can condition a quarterback with that and say hey listen 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 we're in a long to go situation if you see that linebacker there it's coming okay so there are ways to pick up on these kind of things. So we're, we're just trying to match our calls up with these tendencies in these specific situations. That's what I encourage guys. Yes, take your so, call sheet. Take your call sheet. And you say, okay, I got, here's another way to, to kind of tackle that here. If we, if we just uh, take a look at this. You see over here, these independent variables over here. So we, we, we basically will create the scenarios ourselves to get these specific looks from that defense. And, that, right. and, then, and then we'll know what they're going to do. Exactly. So you could come in here and say, okay, maybe on your call sheet, you've got something that's like, uh, you know, 11 plus yards to go. If I, if I can hone in on here, I can filter in and say, okay, here's something that matches my call sheet. 
three, if they're in a three by one and it's 11 or more yards to go, here's, here's what, here's tendencies that pop out. And then you can take those and you're, like on your call sheet, you can just jot them down your call sheet. Hey, just a reminder here, we're in this part, I, my call sheets tell me what calls to make. Now, the thing we do in April can help you with what's on that call sheet. But you can also look at that and say, oh, and look here, here's the reminder. They're, if I see this guy here, they're probably sending pressure. So it's just, it's like populating your call sheet with some of these things that stick out that you wouldn't have seen in any other way. So that's really the right way to approach it is to take a report like this that has thousands and thousands and thousands of things in it and dial up call sheet situations and see if there's something in there that sticks out that you can say, oh my God, I need to make myself aware of that, okay? The other thing we do, and now this is, um, so we take the same data. So this is, this is this report, it's got thousands and thousands of things in it. We also have an application you can use, it's cloud-based. Um, you can go on your phone, you can be on the practice field. If you're a high school team and you can use electronics during a game, you can do this live during a game. It taps into that same data. But this now, just envision, I get this on my computer screen, but you can just it's on your phone too. You can just log in on your phone and in real time, you can dial up any situation you want. And as, as quickly as you do, it basically blends all the probabilities together and gives you a prediction of what's likely coming on the next play. So if I'm a defensive coordinator, it's second down, seven to 10, I'm in a certain part of the field and they're in uh, 11 personnel. Here's the kind of things that are probably coming. Here's the probabilities we see associated with those. You know, they send they bring a motion, they motion to the right. Now it looks like this. So as quickly as you can characterize something in real time, it also pings that data and kicks out this blended probability of, hey, here's a predictive look at what's probably coming next in that game. Okay. Now, um, Again, if there's uh, you know, more questions, by all means, we'll, we'll, I'll take questions, do all that kind of stuff. I, I want to be careful of everybody's time, so I got to get off this, the screen here probably in a second. But I think to kind of again bring it all full circle again, the thing that's important. So I, I know when we talk to coaches, most of the time we say, why you, you know, if you ask coaches, why are you breaking down film? Overwhelmingly, the response is because I'm trying to. It's a predictive response. The, usually the answer is I want to know what he's going to do so I because so, so I can see so I can pick up his tendencies that's that's really the big thrust so much of people breaking down film the problem is there are like like we said here I hope this is what I hope your takeaway is there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of places in there where where you can have tendencies that are like rock solid like boom 80 90 100 percent likely to happen you, you probably don't see them very much in, in standard tendency reports because they're not looking in the unique combinations of things where those reveal themselves. But if you walk away from anything, walk away knowing they're there and it is possible to know. To do it, if you set your data upright, there are tools and there are methods you can use that can flush them out. And you know how this goes. You know, most games are decided by that handful of plays. But if, if in even one or two or three of those handful of plays, you were able to flush something out that was like, hey, I not only do I have a good idea where he's going, I know what exactly what he's doing here. That can change the game. And probably the, probably the best example I have of that one, you go back to the, you know, the, the Seahawks Patriots Super Bowl a couple of years ago when they um, Russell Wilson threw that pick at the goal line. If you remember that game, the, the game that they should have given the ball to Marshawn Lynch. <laughs> But in that game, they talked about that after the game. They, they have an analyst on their staff who's kind of an old school guy. Um, but they had seen in there, they had seen, the, they'd only done that a few times in the year, but they had, they had noticed that right before that play, and they knew that play was coming, right? And that won a Super Bowl. It's, it's this kind of thing. It's like that. It's like, hey, you know, this, this probably would have come out in that scan saying, hey, if you see him in the goal line with this look, it might have only been like three or four times, but it might have been four out of four. They run this little hitch route thing. It's there to be seen, but but you have to dig for them. So can we use this as self-scouting too to find out what we're doing that's predictive? Yeah, it works with any set of data, exactly. So because a lot of guys will do that. They'll they'll put their own data in there and look for their own tendencies. So they can be so you can do tendency breaking and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'll stick around if there's more questions. Otherwise, guys, thanks so much for participating. Um, again, look for the one in April. Look for an email with the notes. If you want to shoot us some data and say, hey, spin me up a tendency thing. I want to take a look at what it might look like. By all means, do. 
And uh, we appreciate you taking this much time with us. All right.